crossing the border, but accidentally arriving at the peak of the Golden Dynasty, he became the only son of the Dragon King and the Dragon God, and the only demigod of the sky city of Fam Azra. At that time, the Great Alden Ring had not yet broken, and the conflict between the goddess and the new king was only a slight hint. In their youth, Montgomery and Latarn only knew how to wield swords and guns, while Lani and Malinia were still two little girls in this golden age where flowers bloom on the surface and hidden tides surge inside, a newborn little dragon steps into the unfathomable vortex of the royal capital rotor as a proton, embarking on a legendary journey. Many, many years later, perhaps we should define the existence of Lucia Sanks in this way. He is the horn of dawn and the bell of old days. Keywords of the novel Alden The ring of disaster without a pop-dot-up window Alden The ring of disaster Download the complete set of TXT Alden The ring of disaster Latest chapter reading Chapter 1 Quantity You are listening at NovelFull.audio Chapter 1 Quantity, Name Lucia Sank's race. Gu Long, Royal, Level. 60 Attributes. 30 HP, 15 Concentration, 15 Endurance, 25 Strength, 20 Dexterity, 9 Intelligence, 15 Belief, 10 Induction Skills. Ancient Dragon Warfare, Not Mainstream, Storm Swordsmanship, Not Mainstream, Legendary Ability. Dragon Blood Inheritance, Unlocked, Comma. Not unlocked amidst the slightly bumpy carriage, a young man who appeared to be around 14 or 15 years old looked bored at the data panel in his consciousness, his gaze fixed on a certain attribute that reached nine points for a long time, and then sighed in frustration. He has long silver hair shining like frost and snow, and his ice blue and clear eyes sparkle with a faint golden radiance. If measured by human standards, this skin bag is already perfect. As expected, he traveled, and even to the world of Alden, where he had spent the longest time this year. As a bone ash level fader with over 2000 hours of experience in quick pass and quick kill in his past life, he is familiar with the location of every artifact hidden in the border area, the flaws in every boss's move, and even the orientation of the heads and buttocks of the dungeon monsters in each level. He firmly believes that whenever he crosses into the era of faders with specialized skills, if the fallen leaves don't have time to bring news, he can penetrate the border area all the way and become the king of Elden. But unexpectedly, he neither traveled to the appropriate era nor became a fading person, not even a human. It is now the 46th year of the Golden Calendar, and the Great Elder Ring has not yet broken. The supreme ruler of the border, the Eternal Queen, Marika, occupies the Alton Plateau and established the Golden Dynasty less than half a century ago. The earth-shattering, ancient dragon war, between the sky city of Fam Yasla and the Golden Dynasty has only come to an end for more than ten years. As for the group of demigods who made trouble in the shattered war in later generations, most of them are still a group of teenagers. And he himself, Lucia Sanks, the only son of the dragon king and the dragon god, inexplicably became the only ancient dragon demigod in the world after breaking out of a supposedly dormant, supreme egg, for thousands of years, naturally becoming the first inheritor of Sky City's legal principles. Normally, this kind of dragon with top-dot-level bloodline and the inheritance rights of the world's top three levels of power should be the beginning of Long Outian, who makes the walkers laugh in their dreams. However, unfortunately, this is the world of Elden's magic ring. According to the following historical development trajectory, there was no precedent for the Golden Age demigods to live like humans. Those who were assassinated, exiled to the sewer, those who had their feet chopped off and became insane, those who were devoured by a large snake, those whose bodies were burned and boarded on dolls, those who were kidnapped by perverts while sleeping, and those who were corrupted by crimson to the point of only having one hand. This is clearly the world's most high-dot-risk profession, okay. As for the Sky City that he nominally inherited, after learning to fly in the form of an ancient dragon, Lucia once looked at the panoramic view of Fam Azra from high altitude. Although this floating giant city was not yet as dilapidated as the Fading Age, 
its windy appearance made it a miracle to float in the sky without falling. What's even more outrageous is that Lucia faced more than that. Less than three months after coming out of that damn dragon egg, Sky City received a letter from the Golden Dynasty. The book first fully expresses the congratulations of Her Majesty the Eternal Queen Marika and Her Majesty the King of Alden Radagon on the birth of Lucia, and then emphasizes the profound friendship between the two countries over the past decade. Finally, with a twist of the pen, the true purpose of this national letter is presented, the two your highnesses are concerned about the serious injury and slumber of the Dragon King, as well as the dilapidated and dilapidated Sky City. Therefore, they invite Prince Lucia to visit the royal capital of Rhodes. The Golden Royal Family is bound to provide the prince with the best education and training, as well as the warmth of blood and kinship, as proof of the precious friendship between the two countries. If we ignore the previous and subsequent nonsense, the other party's intention is obviously incredibly simple, it's just asking him to become a proton in Rhodes. So, less than two weeks after receiving the official letter, Lucia embarked on a journey to the Golden Kingdom. It was not his persuasion, but the current Sky City did not have the qualifications to confront the Golden Dynasty head. On. The semi god level powerhouses on their side can't even count a single hand, and there are as many heroes as cows. On his own side, the Dragon King has been sleeping and recuperating in the cracks of time and space since the Great War a thousand years ago. The mother of the flying dragon, Guer, has also been sleeping in Gallard since then. The high priest of the Sky Temple, Gyllensanks, died in Roger thirteen years ago. The two truly capable warriors. Lance Sanks served as the Gyllensanks priest in Roger. For ten years, she has not returned to Sky City much, and Lucia is completely unfamiliar with them. As for her brother, Falsanks, is just as good as the Golden Prince, Godwin, in a pair of pants. In this situation, does it rely on his own level 60 combat power to refuse Her Majesty the Queen's invitation? Lucia shook her head and let go of those tedious thoughts. Whether he wanted it or not, the identity of this proton could not escape at the moment. As a bargaining chip used in peacetime and an awkward presence of sacrificing flags during wartime, he still thinks about how to quickly improve his strength and find ways to survive in this situation. At this moment, the speed slowed down slightly and a sound of approaching hooves came from outside the window. Your Highness, we have arrived at the Vanya River Valley. Should we stay overnight on the spot, or accelerate another fifty miles to rest in the town of Vanya ahead? The person outside the car respectfully asked. Lucia opened the car window and saw a tall dragon scale horse parallel to the side of the carriage. On the horse's back sat a handsome young man with grey hair and red pupils, who was one of the two captains of the Sky City Missions Guards. Flying Dragon Agkis Garrison on site and skip the town of Vania early tomorrow morning to repair the city of Karen ahead, Lucia replied after a moment of contemplation. Not long ago, he had just looked at the route ahead. A distance of fifty miles was not much trouble for them, but it was too difficult for the small town ahead, which only had over a thousand people, to entertain a foreign mission of over five hundred people overnight. Understood. Agkis took orders and drove away, conveying the order to the front and back departments. Soon, the team came to an orderly stop. The accompanying flying dragon warriors were distributed around the camp for vigilance, while the knights set up the camp step by step. About fifteen minutes later, Lucia had already sat in front of the tent that had just been set up in the center of the camp, with a warm bonfire burning in front of him and holding the warm wine that Agkis had just delivered. So, have we settled down all over the campsite? Lucia looked at the young captain of the guard, unable to imagine that he was a high dot level flying dragon with similar strength even among heroes. Agkis bowed slightly and said, Report to your highness, the peripheral defense works have been completed. The storm knights are on duty in three shifts at night, and thirty flying dragon warriors have been stationed in groups at various defense points. Elder Morel and Elder Atok are stationed in the east and west respectively to ensure the safety of the imperial tent. Listening to the well-organized report from the other party, Lucia nodded repeatedly, 
only to be slightly stunned when she heard the last one. She looked up and said, Where's Goyrel? Uh, Agis awkwardly paused for a moment, as if he had carefully organized his language, and said, Captain Garriel has decided to station at the top of the hill on the side of the campsite to ensure that he always keeps track of the situation within the vicinity of more than ten miles. Oh, she didn't say anything else. Lucia said casually. Agkiza's expression froze and he smiled bitterly, it's gone. Lucia smiled noncommittally and placed her wine glass on the stone slab that served as a table. She grabbed the dragon scale knife beside her and stood up, saying, We've been busy for half a day just now, but I've been sitting here resting. It's still a while before dinner, so could you please take me around? It's my duty as a leader to patrol and comfort us. Yes, Agki succinctly instructed, and compared to many arrogant or stubborn dragon races, he always held absolute respect and obedience towards this immature ruler. At this time, it was evening, and a warm and dim twilight fell from the pale red sky. The surface of the Vania River shimmered with sparkling waves, and the meadows on both sides were also faintly dyed into a warm blue-gold color. The two of them slowly walked along the temporary road planned in the camp. Lucia occasionally stopped at a tent where the knights rested, and casually chatted and laughed with him with a nagging attitude. Agkis, on the other hand, always maintained a distance of half a body behind him, his expression rigorous, and he didn't say a word. After turning the inside of the camp around, Lucia walked on her own towards the outside of the camp. As she passed through the heavily guarded gate, the storm knights at the outpost were momentarily taken aback. Then, they all tapped their breastplates with their right fists, paying formal military salutes to the Lord. For this group of knights who originated in the stormy city of Stamol and later lived in Sky City for generations, serving the Dragon Clan, Storm Knight, was the title they used during this period, rather than the more familiar, Lost Knight, in Lucia. From the camp gate to the outside, the knights and dragon warriors who were seen again were all on duty, so Lucia did not stop talking, but silently returned with a military salute and led Agkis out. The two of them advanced counterclockwise along the outskirts of the camp, and the entire outer wall of the camp was pulled up by two elders using earth elements to pray and level the ground. With the blessing of a layer of rock art, the strength was comparable to that of a small city's wall. Knights wearing heavy armor patrolled the wall with their swords, constantly alert to the movements of the periphery. This level of defense cannot be considered too cautious. Escorting a prince of one country to act as a proton in another country is already a highly sensitive political event, especially since these two countries are still two behemoths that were in conflict more than ten years ago. If not guaranteed, third-party forces will try to seize the opportunity to stir up the situation. Furthermore, although the Vanya Valley is already located in the hinterland of the Golden Dynasty, there is still a considerable distance from the core and most powerful control area of the dynasty, the Alton region. On the contrary, it is almost adjacent to the still turbulent Pmir volcano. It is quite common to encounter some rebellious Asian tribes and mountain demon wandering tribes. Around the watchtower at one corner of the campsite, there is a hill several tens of meters high on the side, with a view that radiates over ten miles around. At this point, Lucia stopped and looked up at a giant rock on the edge of the mountaintop, with a slender figure sitting on it. That is a brave young girl with a high ponytail and two dragon scale swords hanging on her back. Her actual age is as young as her appearance, but she is relatively young compared to the dragon clan. At the age of 216, the rising flying dragon Gylier has the same strength as Agkis and is recognized as the best candidate for the next Sky City Elder Council. Her eyes closed slightly, allowing the evening breeze to blow the hair at her temples, but her body remained motionless like an extension of a giant stone. Even though Lucia and Agkis were within a hundred steps, she did not respond. Seeing this situation, Agkis was a bit angry and stepped forward, saying, Your Highness, do you need me to summon Captain Gariel to come down and obey? It's okay, let's go. Lucia smiled lightly and shook her head, retracting her gaze towards the mountaintop and continuing along the Vania River. 
The blandness he displayed was not a performance for political purposes, but a heartfelt indifference. In the past three months, he has basically understood the current internal situation of Sky City. Since the Forbidden War that was not recorded in history a thousand years ago, the Dragon King was seriously injured and fell asleep, and the Dragon God was nowhere to be found. The power core of Sky City undoubtedly fell on the high priest Gyulensanks. Thirteen years ago, after the death of Gyulensanks in battle, the affairs of the Gulong dynasty became the joint decision of the two priests, Lankensanks and Fusanks, as well as the Senate and Presbyterian Council. For over a decade, this vast power network composed of two priests, seven elders, and 40.8 elders has generated countless disagreements and struggles due to their close or hostile attitudes towards the Golden Dynasty, and has further divided into various factions of all sizes. There are ambitious individuals in this group who try to control him, as well as surrendering factions who see him as a stumbling block. In situations like Guillaume, they are at best the third type. They are loyal to the identity of the half-god of the ancient dragon, but have not truly recognized Lucia himself. For this ancient, proud, stubborn, and power-loving dragon race, they may be willing to sacrifice their own lives to defend Lucia's life and dignity, but they will never truly surrender before the latter demonstrates a capacity that matches their identity. Your Highness, are you really not angry about the situation just now? Agkis couldn't help but ask as he moved away from the hill. Lucia, who was walking ahead, stopped at the words and turned her back to Agkis, saying, I roughly understand Gariel's attitude. She was angry that I accepted the invitation of the Golden Dynasty and agreed to become a proton in Rhodes, right? I, as a wet and wet prince, haven't even proven my qualifications as the heir of the ancient Dragon Dynasty. Ignoring the opposition of many elders, I made almost shameful compromises to other countries. In her eyes, this first impression is really bad enough, isn't it? Upon hearing this, Agkis was immediately stunned and at a loss. Your Highness, do not underestimate yourself. Your decision is for the sake of the overall situation. Priest Lance, and many elders. It's okay, Agkis, Lucia turned her head and interrupted the boy behind her with a smile. I'm not criticizing or mocking anything, nor do I mean to be self-deprecating. Ultimately, they need me to prove something, and I will prove it to them, he said softly. End of this chapter. Chapter 2. Night Attack. You are listening at NovelFull.audio. Chapter 2 Night Attack Late at night, in the Imperial Tent, a candlelight was lit on the table, and the tranquil incense burner beside it was quietly burning, emitting a faint fragrance of herbs. Lucia sat by the bed, carefully reading a book in her hand titled, The Origins of the Wood Dynasty Faith. As one of the earliest civilizations in human history, the Wuda dynasty emerged in the early Starry Moon period, about 3,000 years ago, and became a unified and centralized kingdom that can be traced back to the early days of the construction of Sky City. The ancestors of Wuda, who believed in the God of Craftsmanship, Valastok, and the people of Cape, who believed in the ancestral spirit, were active in the central border area, which is now the wealthiest altar region, and established a civilization that was no less glorious than the Southern Storm Dynasty on the mainland. However, about a thousand years ago, at the peak of the development of the Wuda Dynasty in its history, a war that was obscure in history almost overnight destroyed all civilizations centered around the altar region during the Starry Moon era. The Wuda dynasty and the Horde tribe were completely destroyed, and most of the Sky City, originally located in the center of the continent, of the Gulong dynasty collapsed and drifted to the Far East Sea. Even Stoneville and Galad, who were thousands of miles away, experienced a large dot-scale decline in civilization during the same period. This great war, according to the oral tradition within Gulong, is known as the Forbidden War. The cause, participants, and process of war are all unrecorded, Lucia flipped through the thin two-page pages of the book written in the style of spring and autumn. This phenomenon not only appeared in historical books compiled by later scholars, but also in many first-hand historical materials passed down hundreds of years ago. For some unknown reason, 
all the people who survived the taboo war chose to remain silent about it, to the extent that later generations can only feel a strange feeling similar to the world being deleted and reopened when looking back at that period of history. Lucia tried to decipher the mystery of the game by combining it with the storyline of her past life, but after thinking for a while, she had no idea. She had to put down the book in her hand, move her neck and shoulders, and get up to go outside the tent. It's almost midnight now, and the patrolling knights have been replaced by the second squad. The entire campsite is peaceful, with only the sound of the patrol team's armor colliding and rubbing against each other, and the gentle and soothing sound of the night breeze in their ears. Feeling the refreshing evening breeze brushing against his cheeks, he closed his eyes and took a deep breath, allowing the slightly cold air of early autumn to seep into his lungs. His spiritual power extended like a huge spider web in all directions, quickly covering the entire campsite and expanding hundreds of meters in the wilderness before stopping. As a pure-blooded half-god of the ancient dragon, Lucia discovered early on that he possessed a talent for concentration. Or rather, spiritual power. That was no less than that of the physical body. Although there are no red, blue, and green bars in reality that represent blood demon endurance, concentrating this attribute still represents the strength of spiritual power. After refining spiritual power into divine or magical power for releasing prayer and magic, this attribute directly determines how many times an individual can release spells. Compared to those in the Storm Knights who have similar combat abilities to him, Lucia's spiritual power is clearly stronger than theirs. Even without systematic cultivation, he can now easily sense the wind and grass within a radius of one kilometer. Even the Dragon Clan elders, upon learning this, unanimously believe that the prince will make significant contributions in the field of ancient dragon prayer in the future. He calmed down and deliberately captured the activities of various nocturnal animals around him, in order to train his mastery of spiritual power. Quickly, the subtle movements from all directions were like prey touching the spider silk, feeding back information to his mind. The night falcon preparing to hunt the wild rabbit, a few swimming fish migrating up, and two crickets fighting fiercely, and so on. What was that? Lucia's mind was shaken, and a stirring noise suddenly appeared in his spiritual horizon, 300 meters south of the campsite, like a crack in space, emitting a cold and gloomy aura. However, when he opened his eyes and looked over, he could only see a peaceful night like water. Immediately after, more noise appeared in all directions, surrounding the camp, and strands of eerie and terrifying aura filled the air. The knights on patrol felt abnormal, but before they could determine the cause, they heard Lucia shouting from the direction of the tent. Enemy attack. At the moment of shouting, more than twenty layered patterns resembling pupils emerged from the noisy direction, burning black and white flames. The cold air spread out like a tide, staining the nearby grass leaves with a thin layer of frost. A group of figures dressed in dismal white leather clothes and hooded hats emerged from the coat of arms. They hung a huge knight-colored gemstone on their chests, holding double-headed swords made of material similar to white bone, exuding a strong and powerful aura from their bodies. Apostle of the Divine Skin Agkis, who rushed out of the camp with a spear in hand, was stunned for a moment before shouting in shock. For thousands of years, the Divine Skin Apostles have been a mysterious group no less mysterious than the Black Blade Assassins. Compared to the latter, which has been rumored occasionally in recent years, they have disappeared for hundreds of years. Even the widely known Dragon Clan only knows that they once served the mysterious and unpredictable Night Eyed Queen, and then disappeared into the depths of history together. At the moment of seeing these guys, Lucia quickly rushed back to the Imperial Tent, wielding a sword while unleashing a spiritual force that triggered the divine barrier set up by the two elders in the tent. In the blink of an eye, a spherical barrier shrouded in thunder and dragon flames rose from the outer circle of the ground, encompassing the entire imperial tent. As for going out and fighting with people, it's completely beyond Lucia's consideration. In the three months after breaking the shell, he had already determined his weight through repeated experiments. Now, he struggles to fight against two or more storm knights, let alone this group of divine skin apostles with average boss strength. 
The only thing he can do now is to cherish himself and avoid causing trouble for Agkis and the others. On the unnamed hill to the west of the campsite, Gariel almost immediately sensed something unusual while Lucia was loudly warning. When the Divine Skin Apostles appeared, she immediately chose the direction with the most enemies and prepared to launch an attack from the rear. Just as she was about to jump off the mountaintop, a chill suddenly came from all over her body, and a sharp roar of a blade tearing open the air echoed in her ear. Years of combat experience have made Gylier instinctively turn his head away, avoiding a thin sword piercing from behind. At the same time, he twisted his body in extreme state and turned back to cut a curved sword light. The dragon scale Tidal collided fiercely with the thin sword, igniting a firefly like flame. Under the moonlight, Gylier could see the terrifying and imposing figure behind him. It was a divine leather nobleman. And the narrow-edged thin sword in his hand, which shimmered with a cold and eerie light, was said to be the most ferocious and evil sword, the divine leather sewing needle, which was said to kill gods and turn their skin into battle robes. Gylier slightly bent his legs, grabbed the dragon scale sword with a white wrist, and in an instant, his slender and agile figure blurred into a ghostly silhouette shooting forward. In the cold moonlight, white dragon scales covered her body like flowing water, cold and hard bone armor covered her face, her temples turned into towering dragon horns, and her sword-wielding arms turned into muscular dragon claws. When the dragon scale blade was in the center and struck the divine leather sewing needle that came from the horizontal frame of the divine leather aristocrat, a tremendous force like mountains and seas poured down the sword, even the huge and strong body of the divine leather aristocrat couldn't help but stumble back. Humph, the nobleman sneered, the dragon clan is truly the most powerful creature in the world. Even if it's just a high dot level flying dragon, can it possess this level of power after semi-dragon transformation? At the same time, a similar situation also occurred in the camp at the foot of the mountain. Although the sudden attack of the Divine Skin Apostles caused some damage to the Storm Knights, after a brief moment of shock, the Flying Dragon Warriors immediately launched a strong counterattack with their hair on. Even though most of them were lower-ranking Flying Dragons with much lower bloodline than Agkis and Gariel, they were able to suppress an Apostle in a 3-to-1 or even 2-to-1 situation after half-dragon transformation. In the location where the two Elders and Agkis were located, the apostles were beaten and retreated step by step. In just two to three minutes from the start of the raid until now, nearly ten of their bodies had been thrown down throughout the camp. Since you know you're not a match, who gave you the courage to invade the throne? Gylier said coldly, while continuously cutting out a wave of sword-like light. In this fierce attack, the divine peel nobleman held a sword with one hand, his arm stretching and changing like rubber, always able to block or dodge Gylier's slashes at the last moment. After evading another heavy strike that was powerful enough to break the mountain and rock, he stepped a little and his bulky body lightly swept up a rock behind him, chuckling lightly and saying, Miss, it seems you've made a mistake. You are indeed the most powerful beings in the immortal world, he said in a fanatical voice as he opened his arms. But we, on the other hand, are following the Queen of Death and the existence of the God Killer. Before he could finish speaking, an endless black flame rose from his feet, instantly turning the entire mountaintop into a burning torch. Dozens of fiery pillars of fire were like insurmountable cages, imprisoning himself and Gylier here together. I've been playing around with you for so long without any pain or itching, just because my task is just delaying you here, the flames reflected on the hood shaped like a face on the nobleman's head, showing a mocking neary smile. We were born to kill gods, and only gods are worth our all, regardless of life and death. Gylier's expression changed upon hearing this, and she suddenly turned her head to look down the mountain. The remaining apostles launched a suicidal charge in the direction of the two elders and Agkis without warning, delaying the three strong men. At the same time, another black flame emblem appeared outside the closest camp wall to the imperial tent. In the blazing flames, the second divine skin noble killed two caught-off guard flying dragon warriors in the midst of lightning and fire, heading straight towards Lucia. End of this chapter. Chapter 3 Nobility 
You are listening at NovelFull.audio. Chapter 3 Nobility, Stop Him Agkis, who had a keen insight into the intentions of the divine peers, shouted towards the direction where the camp wall had been breached. The nearby storm knights immediately rushed forward regardless of life or death, waving their swords and unleashing an invisible air blade that roared through the air, slashing towards the divine skin nobles ahead. For a moment, the air was filled with sharp screams, and even the remnants of those air blades were enough to turn all the grass, wood, and soil along the way into powder. Among the three oldest orthodox swordsmanship passed down in the border area, storm swordsmanship, originating from Stamol, is neither as unpredictable as Kalian swordsmanship nor as rigorous as road swordsmanship. However, in terms of explosive swordsmanship, it far surpasses the two equally famous swordsmanship. If a seasoned storm knight had the opportunity to suddenly slay opponents of the same level within ten moves in a match between equally powerful knights. However, at this moment, the enemies faced by the knights were not equivalent knights, but rather a god-skinned nobleman who even ranked among the top heroes and even killed gods. Among those mysterious and powerful apostles, only the oldest and most terrifying few or so were able to receive the title of queen and become the supreme existence of nobility. Courage is worthy of praise, but strength. Samuel, a nobleman with divine skin, let out a disdainful chuckle from under his hood. Unbeatable. As the words fell, his wrist suddenly exerted force, drawing a perfect arc in front of him with the blade of a divine leather needle. When the end point and starting point of the arc intersected, a black and white intertwined fireball suddenly emerged from the air, and then suddenly erupted into a blazing vortex, devouring more than ten air blades and all nearby knights. The black flame vortex only passed for a brief moment from expansion to collapse, and the storm knights blocking the way still maintained a charging posture. However, their bodies had been burned into charred charcoal pillars, and then turned into flying ash scattered in the strong wind swept by Samuel. For a moment, there was no longer any obstacle between Samuel and the royal tent. At the critical moment, a deafening dragon roar erupted from the west side of the camp. Flying dragon elder Atak, who was fiercely fighting with three divine skin apostles, risked his injury and chose to completely transform into a dragon. In the complete form of a flying dragon, his defense and strength will be greatly enhanced, but his agility will also decrease correspondingly with the sharp increase in body size. In battles against enemies at the level of the Divine Skin Apostle, his safety is far lower than that of the more agile half-dragon transformation. The three apostles surrounding the dragon immediately bullied forward upon seeing the situation, seizing the small flaw in Atok's defense when he changed form. They decisively and ruthlessly peeled off the divine skin wrapped in black flames and stabbed it with swords, leaving three sword wounds on Atak's shoulders and the end of his right wing. Yadik let out a low growl of pain, and a hint of violence flashed through his bright red dragon eyes. While injured, he launched a fierce counterattack, with a powerful and powerful dragon tail sweeping through with tremendous explosive power. With a piercing roar that tore through the air, he drew the three apostles into a mist of blood. At the same time as breaking free from the siege, the flying dragon elder immediately stood up and swiftly swept to the side of the imperial tent with his wings bulging, blocking Samuel's oncoming attack. As long as they blocked the opponent for two minutes, or even one minute, the flying dragon warriors and storm knights can completely annihilate the divine skin apostles who broke into the camp. When Merrill and Agkisson take action, not only will the tent be completely safe, but even the escape of these guys is a problem. At this moment, Samuel, who was originally rushing forward at lightning speed, suddenly leaped to the side at a strange angle, and then rolled on the spot. His broad body turned into a rapidly rolling ball and collided with him. Just as Atak was preparing to confront him head dot on, Samuel's curled figure suddenly relaxed, and a faint and invisible wave of energy exploded from his pale leather jacket, producing a deafening explosion. Under this pattern, the air waves generated in an instant unexpectedly blasted the flying dragon like a talk out dozens of steps. Except for the imperial tent protected by the divine barrier, everything within a radius of 100 meters exploded radially in all directions, 
even the barrier intertwined with thunder and fire was shaking and crumbling under the impact. Is this the aristocratic aura? Within the imperial tent, Lucia, who was tightly holding the dragon scale blade, was also shocked and her ears were bleeding, causing her to collapse on her back. Without waiting for him to stand up, a blade wrapped in black flames had already pierced through the outer wall of the imperial tent, and at an extremely fast speed, a cross-shaped slash struck. The entire imperial tent suddenly split into pieces like a persimmon split by a kitchen knife. As the figure in a pale leather coat leaped into view, the divine leather sewing needle had already turned into a blurry glow, piercing through Lucia's throat. Between life and death, the battle instinct etched in his bone marrow forced him to suddenly roll sideways, dodging a sword at his limit while swinging his sword forward, blocking his almost invisible second slash. At the moment when the swords intersected, Lucia's arm holding the knife experienced a sharp pain, and an unstoppable terrifying force lifted him from the ground, shattering the table and table behind him and slamming it heavily onto the ground. A few steps away, Samuel tiptoed lightly, his massive body rising out of nowhere with a completely unconventional agility. His outstretched arms thrust the divine leather needle forward, and his sharp sword-like thread seemed to slide into a gap in space, approaching Lucia's heart in an instant. Suddenly, he saw the unavoidable young man inexplicably grabbing a scattered incense burner on the ground and throwing it at him with all his might. Although he knew he wouldn't get hurt, Samuel naturally didn't want to be hit in the face by that playful thing, so he casually swung his sword to block it and chopped it half a meter away from his face. Bang! A pale purple smoke exploded as the incense burner shattered. At the moment when the aroma of herbal medicine drifted into his nose, Samuel felt his brain go blank. A drowsiness that surged to the sky overwhelmed all rational thinking. So, in front of everyone, this powerful divine skin nobleman fell to the ground like a fly hit by an electric mosquito, his limbs twitching unconsciously a few times, followed by deafening snoring. At this moment it was unclear whether it was Lucia's illusion or not. The once bustling battlefield suddenly fell silent, and the desperate and angry expressions on the faces of Eggies and others solidified into capital letters of confusion. The apostles of the divine skin looked at each other, and the eerie faces on the hood that covered their faces looked like comical clowns. In the center of the battlefield, where countless lines of sight intertwined, Lucia, with a pale face, climbed up and took Samuel's divine skin sewing needle with her hand. She gasped for breath while cursing, Bastard, do you understand the gold content of the tranquil fragrance in the dosage of the ancient dragon? As is well known. Mao Duo is weak in fire, the body is large and weak in door, the meat monster sword chops, the shell is thick and the hammer is on top, the human is weak in hitting the dragon and weak in health, and the divine skin dog bear is weak in sleep. Based on the experience of Lucia I, things like the great body and the weak gait probably no longer exist. Fortunately, the weak sleep of the divine skin did not disappear due to time travel, otherwise someone would have become the first fallen demigod of the Golden Age. A gust of strong wind rushed towards him, and Atak, who had reacted, flew to Lucia's side at the first moment. He spread his dragon-like wings to protect him, while the storm knights rushed in from all directions, using their large shields and spears to build an iron barrier around him. Your Highness, are you not injured? Yaddick lowered his dragon head and said in a muffled voice. At the same time, the knights have taken out the arm-thick enchanting chains and bound Samuel into Zongzi in circles. I'm fine, leave me alone for now. Give this guy a few dragon breath seals. Yaddick nodded slightly and spat out a highly precise dragon flame toward Samuel, instantly turning the originally dark enchanted chain into a faint golden red. After the seal is completed, if Samuel wants to break through the chain, he must first bear the cost of his body being burned by the dragon flame. On the other hand, Agkis and Elder Morel had no further worries and released their hands and feet, while the divine skin apostles began to fight and retreat, turning into black flames and disappearing after dropping four or five corpses. Another noble named Shimpi, who was fighting against Gylier on the hill, 
also used all his strength to briefly push back the former and immediately fled the battlefield. The night raid lasted only a few minutes from the beginning to the end, but the Gulong mission seemed to have encountered a localized battle. The sturdy walls of the camp became dilapidated, and a large area centered around the imperial tent was turned into a white ground by Samuel's aristocratic aura. Incomplete corpses, burning tents, and shocking bloodstains were everywhere, and some corpses even burned with black after fires. Lucia stared blankly at everything in front of him. For a long time, he took a deep breath and called out two names, Orvans, Anasia, stand out. The two people who were pointed out were both stunned. They were not senior officers, but two mid-level knights in charge of a team of storm knights in each mission. Therefore, they never expected their names to be remembered by the prince. However, due to the instinct of soldiers to obey orders, the two of them immediately stepped out and answered. Lucia looked at the two young officers in their early twenties in front of her and said in a deep voice, I regret to notice that Captain Kevin, who is responsible for overseeing the Storm Knights, has sacrificed himself in the attack just now. Now I need you to recalculate the number of people and casualties in the camp, reorganize the remaining Storm Knights into two teams, and dispatch a detachment to escort the injured and the bodies of their comrades back to the Sky City as soon as possible. Understand. Understood. The two responded without hesitation. So, Lucia turned her gaze to the others, Elder Morel, Agkis, and Gariel, please take this divine skin nobleman with me to the barracks for interrogation. Elder Atak, please take care of your injuries first and then meet us again. After the four of them agreed to leave, he turned around on his own and headed straight towards the direction of the barracks tent. Looking at the figure ahead, a hint of strangeness appeared in Gariel's pale blue eyes. His previous contact with Central Lucia had not left a very good impression on him, especially accepting the invitation from the Golden Dynasty, which she saw as a pure cowardly act. However, at the moment, this guy has just narrowly survived the assassination, why is he showing such composure instead? It's really hard to see through, end of this chapter. Chapter 4 Prophecy you are listening at NovelFull.audio. Chapter 4 Prophecy The collision of his fists and cheeks made a muffled sound of flesh and blood clashing, and a flurry of blood exploded. Agkis used his dragon-like arm to tightly grip Samuel's collar, his eyes seeming to spew flames. Let me ask again, name, position, and who is the main messenger behind you? After his divine power was suppressed by the dragon breath seal, Samuel's figure had returned to the realm of a normal person. Under his eerie and terrifying hood, there was not a fierce and evil spirit hidden, but rather a handsome middle-aged face with a hint of vicissitudes. However, at this moment, he was like a soulless puppet. No matter how Agkis tortured and interrogated him, he just swayed along with the opponent's strength, not only remained silent, but even his eyes were dim like a stagnant pool, unable to see any emotional fluctuations in it. Just now, Elder Atak, who had completed his healing, brought the latest casualty statistics. Three of the thirty accompanying dragon warriors died in battle and two were seriously injured, while the Storm Knights, with a total of five hundred people, died in battle and twenty were seriously injured. Therefore, at this moment, all five leaders of the Chinese military, including Lucia, in the tent of the Chinese military camp wanted to crush Samuel to the ashes. Stop first, Agkis. Just as Agkis was about to take a heavy hit, Lucia's faint words came from behind. Yes, he said, retreating to the side and watching his young lord slowly pace up to the damn god-skinned nobleman, silently gazing at him. After a while, Samuel, who had been pretending to be dead, couldn't help but twist his shoulders. For some reason, the gaze in the ice blue eyes across from him always made him feel uncomfortable, as if all his weaknesses and flaws were nowhere to hide, all exposed in the other person's eyes. This strange feeling was not created out of thin air. Thinking about everything that had just happened, he racked his brains and couldn't figure out how this kid had brought himself down. Just as Samuel was about to lose his patience and prepare to roar, Lucia suddenly turned around, pacing and pondering. 
Suddenly, his footsteps stopped and he turned his gaze and sneered, people all thought that his majesty had died in the battle with Queen Marika. They never expected her to survive until this era. Why, they thought that by killing me, the ancient dragon demigod, and provoking a conflict between Sky City and Rotor, she would have a chance to climb out of the sewer and restore her dynasty. As soon as these words were spoken, the other four people in the tent stood up in shock. Samuel's previously calm expression was immediately replaced by an unshakable surprise, followed by a strong sense of fear and apprehension. His lips moved as if he wanted to ask something. At this moment, a sudden change occurred, and a great will acted on him without warning, forcing him to close his eyes and mouth like an iron bucket. The next second, Samuel's eyelids slowly opened, and his light gray eyes burst into a night like purple glow. Ha! A faint moan and low smile came from his mouth. Strangely, the voice was not the deep and arrogant tone he had when he broke camp, but rather a fleeting and charming one, filled with a seductive and imaginative aura. I never thought anyone in this era would remember me, Samuel said in a relaxed tone. So, as a remnant of the remnants of the Communist Party who have survived from the previous era, should I be grateful to you, Lucia Sanks, who was fortunate enough to be remembered by a new demigod. At this moment, the initiator of this incident, Lucia herself, was completely bewildered and in the same place. She had originally intended to deceive this divine nobleman with a confident attitude, and could deceive him by saying a few words, but what kind of ghost was the face-to-face -face act of seizing and surrendering the gods? The night-eyed queen, who is in charge of destiny's death and controls numerous divine skin apostles to hunt down countless deities, is really alive. Protect your highness. Agkis, who was the first to react, shouted loudly, and his violent figure transformed into a silhouette that swept between Lucia and the captured Samuel. Gailir and the two elders also took action almost at the same time, each wielding their swords to protect the Lucian regiment. Although they all know very little about the night-eyed queen, it does not prevent them from realizing the danger level of the current situation. Less than ten steps away, the existence that created a great panic upon arrival only silently watched everything in front of them. In silence, the air in the tent seemed to be frozen, and the atmosphere was like an extremely tense string. The moment it broke, it would trigger a fierce battle like a storm and thunder. Just as the situation between the two sides reached its climax, Samuel suddenly let out a faint sigh. The first time I met you was in such a situation, it's really ironic and boring. She looked at Lucia behind the wall of people, with a hint of a bitter smile on her lips, and her curvaceous eyes contained a hidden and difficult to understand emotion. I don't understand what you mean, Lucia hesitated slightly. Isn't it because you sent someone to assassinate me? At this moment, recovering from the brief panic, he still had the intention of probing. No matter how the other party answered, he had the opportunity to infer whether the assassination was planned by the Night Eye Queen herself, as well as her purpose, current state, and so on however, the Queen did not answer. She just let out a sigh again and looked at Lucia with a serious expression, saying, Young Dragon, if you have the ability, try to survive in this chaotic world. At this point, Samuel's body, controlled by the dragon breath seal, suddenly ignited a blazing black flame, along with the enchanting iron chains that bound him, turning into disintegrating ashes. Before it completely disintegrated, the queen's last words also drifted down with it, as long as you live, everything is possible. For a long time, looking at the pile of charred ashes on the ground, Girl's confused words broke the silence. What is she talking about? Not only the four people in this tent, but the vast majority of people in this era may not understand the true meaning of Queen Xiaoyan's last words. In times of chaos, it is simply a joke. The current golden age is clearly the most prosperous period of civilization for thousands of years, isn't it okay? If we don't consider the barbaric areas that have not yet been included in the rule of the golden dynasty, the power system combined by Rotor, Kalia, and Sky City has truly achieved the goal of governing people and promoting prosperity, allowing more than 80% of the population in the border areas to live a prosperous and prosperous life. 
How could this situation inexplicably become a chaotic world that requires desperate struggle to survive in the mouth of the other party? But Lucia knows. He knew that the so dot called Golden Age would pass away in the blink of an eye like the lifespan of a mortal, from the shattered war that swept across the continent to the purgatory where the entire border area was reduced to zombies running rampant. He also knew that every high and mighty demigod would be swallowed and annihilated by that catastrophe, and almost all survivors would become monsters that are neither human nor ghost. Do you want to survive? he sighed silently in his heart. It's really a difficult challenge. At the same moment, a faint and intangible energy escaped from the charred ashes and quietly sank into Lucia's chest without anyone noticing. End of this chapter Chapter 5 Memory Battlefield You are listening at NovelFull.audio Chapter 5 Memory Battlefield As soon as the sky brightened, the reorganized mission convoy had already left the camp. A guard consisting of twenty storm knights parted ways with the main team here, responsible for escorting the wounded and the bodies of their sacrificial comrades back to Fam Yasla, while the others marched in a more tightly formed formation towards the northeast direction of Karen City. In the reorganized team, Elder Muriel of the Ancient Dragon opened the way at the front, while Elder Atok of the Flying Dragon, who had suffered some minor injuries last night, was arranged to stand at the back of the team. As for Gariel and Agkis, they each rode a dragon scale horse and guarded the carriage on both sides of Lucia without leaving. With this level of defense, even a demigod cannot easily break through the defense line and pose a threat to Prince Gulong. In the carriage, Lucia placed her dragon scale knife and Samuel's divine leather sewing needle horizontally on her lap, rubbing the two sharp blades with her palms while constantly replaying the life and death battle of last night in her mind. This was the first time he had seen a hero-level figure at the border in real life exert all his might. Samuel's strength, speed, divine power, combat skills, and prayer all overwhelmed him in all aspects, even slightly surpassing Elder Atok. If the 48 elders of Sky City were all regarded as the hero class of combat power, then the divine skin aristocrat would undoubtedly be at the top of it. Based on this as a benchmark, Lucia also gained a rough understanding of the power of the demigods in the Broken War, as well as the higher-ranked Eternal Queen, Marika, Golden Law, Ladigan, War King, Gevry, and others. In short, they are all very strong. And far beyond the strength shown in the game. At the end of the day, Lucia's so dot called understanding of them was only based on countless battles in 2000 hours of gaming experience. However, in reality, the strong players in the border areas are never limited by game mechanics and performance. For example, the strongest demigod Latarn, known for sealing the starry sky in the future, after seeing Samuel's powerful combat power, it is not surprising that Latarn can even unleash moves at the level of Heavenly Obstacle and Shock Star. In thought, Lucia once again summoned his own data panel at the level of consciousness. During the time he had just traveled, he spent an unknown amount of energy studying its specific functions. However, the conclusion he came to was that besides truly reflecting his attributes and skills, this thing was useless. However, this time, as soon as his gaze fell on the panel, a loud noise suddenly came out of his mind. For a moment it was as if countless bells and bells were ringing in unison in the depths of his soul. The scenery before him changed like fleeting shadows, and a vast and boundless starry sky slowly unfolded before him. This sleeping trough. After a brain crash for half a minute, Lucia looked around and the ground beneath his feet was as black as a mirror, stretching endlessly towards the end of the world. He turned his gaze to the starry sky again, and the sky above him presented a dull and lifeless silence. Countless stars, big and small, were scattered throughout the air, like burning wreckage, and like solemn and solemn tombstones. In this space, his soul and body appeared so small, like a speck of dust in the vast sea. Therefore, when Lucia looked up at the starry sky, he unconsciously lost his entire mind and soul, completely immersed in that desolate and magnificent atmosphere. It took him an unknown amount of time before he suddenly regained consciousness, taking deep breaths to calm his throbbing heartbeat, while involuntarily taking a half-step backwards. 
At this moment, his legs suddenly hit a hard object, and he sat down backwards. Looking back, he saw a chair supporting his buttocks. The high-backed chair he had placed in the Sky City study. And as his arm fell down, a familiar desk appeared out of nowhere, coincidentally supporting his wrist. After being stunned for a while, Lucia's heart twitched and she reached out to grip the air. A teacup suddenly appeared between her fingers, containing more than half of the fragrant warm tea. He took a tentative drink, and the temperature and taste of the tea were all the same as the outside world. Next, he made a series of attempts. As long as there were substances in the reality of the border, the vast majority would turn into reality at the moment he had thoughts, projected into this space. Its scope not only included various common items, but also some extremely rare mineral materials, as well as weapons and armor forged through special techniques. Even living creatures with power levels within a certain limit, such as Storm Knight, Realicaria Magician, and Mountain Demon, can be created if he is willing. However, these creatures seem to have no soul, just empty shells. When the test level is raised again and the target is placed on well-known heroes or even demigods in the border area, this creative function becomes ineffective. Moreover, even the various weapons containing their special abilities held by these characters cannot be replicated, such as Latarn's Broken Star Sword, the Night Eye Queen's Hunting God Sword, Marika's Stone Hammer, and so on. Quickly, Lucia realized the root cause of this kind of anomaly, and his spiritual power in this space seemed to have been greatly enhanced, almost to the point of achieving what he wanted. Except for those higher dot order beings who were exposed to the laws of world operation, they could all be constructed by him using his massive spiritual power, like an abyss-like sea. After reaching this conclusion, he slowly exhaled and carefully observed the space from a new perspective, constantly using his mental strength to make various explorations. It has been proven that the ground beneath his feet and the environment around him can change according to his wishes, except for one place where there is no response, which is the starry sky above his head that is in a, extinguished, state. In just a few minutes, Lucia had tried more than a dozen solutions. He could make the sky behind the stars shine, or completely cover the extinguished stars with a normal starry sky, but there was no way to light them up. Isn't there a normally lit one? Lucia muttered. At this moment, as he had been staring at the sky, he suddenly noticed two extremely faint twinkling stars, one located in the center of the sky curtain and the other in the northwest border. However, it is said to be flickering, but in fact, it takes a long time for those two stars to release a faint and imperceptible light, which means that Lucia's spiritual power is too strong now to distinguish them from the surrounding stars. As Lucia focused his thoughts on the central star, it suddenly flew out of the starry sky, transforming into a shooting star that swept before his eyes. Upon closer inspection, the star was made up of a glass-like material, with a virtual image of a silver-white ancient dragon hidden within it. Lucia's expression shook. The ancient dragon was not someone else, it was his own state after being transformed into a dragon. At the same time, Countless beams of glow streamed out from that star, interweaving into a light curtain in mid-air, name. Lucia Sank's race. Gu Long, Royal, Level. 60 Available Rune Points. 15 Attributes. 30 HP, 15 Concentration, 15 Endurance, 25 Strength, 20 Dexterity, 9 Intelligence, 15 Belief, 10 Induction Skills. Ancient Dragon Warfare, not Mainstream, Storm Swordsmanship, not Mainstream, Legendary Abilities. Dragon Blood Inheritance, Unlocked, Memory Battlefield, Unlocked, at the moment when he saw the content clearly, Lucia's heart suddenly stirred up a storm. It was precisely at this moment that he had flipped through countless data panels these days, but only then did he see the content of, Available Luan Points, for the first time. Among the two legendary abilities, Dragon Blood Inheritance, is a potential possessed by every ancient dragon royal family with the name Sanks. As the ancient dragon grows, as long as its spiritual strength reaches a level sufficient to withstand inheritance, it can unlock the deep seal of its bloodline and start learning the content of inheritance on its own. 
As for this, memory battlefield, Lucia looked around and probably said about this space, right. Now it seems that the recently unlocked upgrade feature of the data panel is probably one of the effects of this space. Suppressing his excitement, he carefully considered his plan to increase points. Currently, since he was not clear about the method of increasing Luan's points, he must ensure that the existing points can be used well on the blade to maximize his current combat effectiveness. Otherwise, if he encounters another round of assassination, the enemy may not be the divine skin noble who can be knocked down by his tranquil incense burner. Add life to 41st. After a moment, Lucia made the final decision. The ancient dragon is a powerful race known for its physical fitness, and its scales covering its entire body provide them with a natural defense that is almost impenetrable. Assuming that the upper limit of a single attribute is still 99, increasing its health points to 40 can guarantee that it will not be inexplicably killed by any strong person, right? The remaining 5 points, Lucia also followed the strategy of maximizing his strengths and focused entirely on his strength, elevating it to 30 in one breath. After the final confirmation, a surging heat surged throughout his body. With the spiritual power of the memory battlefield, Lucia clearly felt a significant increase in the strength of the visceral beating in the center of his chest, and the feedback from bones, muscles, and meridians became more powerful due to the surging blood. He was admiring his level 75 data panel with a red face, and suddenly, Yu Guang caught an extremely disharmonious number, which dissipated his good mood. Damn it, I forgot to point my intelligence to at least double digits. End of this chapter. Chapter 6. Samuel. You are listening at NovelFull.audio. Chapter 6 Samuel, Goal. Samuel, the, God Skin Noble, Race. Human Level. 215 Attributes. 45 HP, 50 Concentration, 40 Endurance, 40 Strength, 40 Dexterity, 13 Intelligence, 56 Belief, 10 Induction Skills. Tiberian Warfare, Master, Black Flame Prayer, Master, Furnace Hundred Forms, Master, Legendary Ability. Destined Death, Disqualified, Current Parsing Progress. 17.8%, Unlocked Battle Memory, Next Parsing Node. 20% Have You Entered the Battle of Remembrance. Lucia gazed at the light curtain in mid-air, and countless possibilities surged in her heart for a moment. Similar to the process of summoning his own data panel just now, when he focused his mental energy on another shining star, the divine peel nobleman who had been knocked down by his serene fragrance was also displayed in data form. Of course, now he knows that guy's name is Samuel. The amount of information contained in these short lines of text is too great. Although Samuel had the ability to crush him in all aspects, his level was only a mere 215, which Lucia never expected. However, on the other hand, this further confirms his speculation about high.end combat power in the world. The phenomenon of significant attenuation of gains after various attributes in the game exceed the soft limit of 60.80 is likely to disappear, and a level difference of 2 to 300 levels is reflected in reality, which may even bring about a nearly two-dimensional difference in combat power. In addition, Tibia's combat skills. And the destined death of failing. Lucia remembered the map boss named Tibia's Call Ship from his past life. Legend had it that they were scattered throughout the border, shouldering the mission of guiding the lost. However, when the Golden Dynasty pacified the continent and the return to the tree became the only correct way of death under the Golden Faith system, these so dot called guides who served death also disappeared. So, the Calling Boat, the Divine Skin Apostle, and the Dead Bird are all members of the same faction, all subordinates of the Night-Eyed Queen. Lucia pondered. By the way, he suddenly remembered Guillaume's report on another Divine Skin nobleman, they said they were beings who served the Queen of Death. Dot. Numerous clues strung together in his mind, as the Night-Eyed Queen was defeated in the war with Queen Marika, and most of her traces of existence were erased by the victorious Golden Dynasty. Even the title, Night-Eyed Queen, was a fabrication made by a few who knew a little about that period of history based on its characteristics. 
In fact, Queen of Death is the true title of His Majesty, just like Marika's Eternal Queen. The war between these two deities has lasted for hundreds of years after the War of Taboos, and has also laid the foundation for the current border situation. Looking back at the era of the Fading Ones after the Broken War, Queen Marika had already been sealed on the stone stage inside the Golden Tree, and the demigods were also on the brink of destruction in endless battles. However, the Apostles of the Divine Skin, the Soundship, and the Deathbirds became unprecedentedly active, with their footprints covering Lyonia, Galad, Gmil, and even the Arctic Ice Sheet, entering the hinterland of various factions and stirring up the wind. An indescribable absurdity and horror filled Lucia's heart, looking at it this way, the deity who had just passed by him was really too terrifying. As for the so-called disqualification of the destined death, it is not difficult to guess. Legend has it that the Night Eye Queen ultimately lost to the shadow beast of Queen Marika. The Black Sword, Maricus, and the destined death was also sealed by her. The Shimpi apostles originally held the Black Flame, which originated from the hunting god's sword, and could also use the queen's power to use the death of destiny. After the true death of destiny was sealed, their power deteriorated, and the black flame degenerated from black and red to black and white. Fortunately, if we were to face two divine skin nobles from their heyday today, his life would not have been saved by a censor. Fortunately, there has never been anything special in this world. Now all he needs to do is to improve his own strength as soon as possible. Thinking of this, Lucia turned his gaze to the last line of the screen of light. Should we enter the battle of remembrance? Yes. This time, he didn't hesitate. The sound of flames rising echoed, and a black flame emblem shaped like pupils appeared dozens of steps away. The massive body of the divine leather nobleman Samuel calmly walked out of it, and the sword blade of the divine leather sewing needle, blue and porcelain, soared into the air and charged straight towards Lucia. At the same moment, Lucia also chose to charge towards the opponent. He held his hands weakly, and two dragon scale swords immediately appeared out of thin air. His semi-dragon-like body gave him even more violent power than his human form. As he approached Samuel's tenth step, he suddenly stepped on his feet, and his whole body seemed to turn into a silver siege crossbow shot forward, with the two swords crossing and cutting off in a cross shape. The swords clashed and two short and intense sounds erupted. Samuel's arm trembled and he took a slight step back, with a hint of surprise in his eyes. The little dragon in front of him was obviously a young creature, but in an instant, it erupted with almost equal strength to him. On the other side, Lucia took three full steps back before barely dissipating the terrifying force emanating from the blade. He swallowed a mouthful of saliva, and a hint of sweet and fishy smell came from his throat. The match just now may seem like a slight setback for him, but it was just an illusion caused by his physical advantage after the half-dragon transformation of the ancient dragon. Samuel not only overshadowed him in terms of strength, but also in terms of skills. At the moment when the swords intersected, Samuel activated the furnace hundred elements and extended his wrist like rubber, coincidentally hitting the weakest point of the dragon scale blade strength, under two huge forces of confrontation, Samuel was unscathed, but he was hit hard by the power hidden in the divine leather needle, instantly suffering a considerable shock injury. Oh, that's really impressive. Lucia spat out a mouthful of blood foam from the side of her head and swung her sword forward again. With his current strength, he has no chance of winning this battle, and Lucia has had this consciousness since the moment Samuel appeared. What he wants to do is not to defeat his opponent, but to hone himself in this simulated battle while trying to push forward the still unclear analysis progress. With this idea in mind, he fought against Samuel with a completely reckless approach, not afraid of the rapidly increasing wounds on his body, but simply pursuing to maximize his strength and force Samuel to use more moves. After 19 moves, Samuel's sword pierced through Lucia's heart, and the Celadon blade rose with black and white flames, burning him to ashes. The next second, both of them turned into countless light dots and exploded. When Lucia regained her senses, she found herself once again in front of that light curtain, completely intact. 
In the light screen, Samuel's various data naturally did not change, except for the current parsing progress, which barely scraped forward from 17.8% to 18.1%. Just rising so much. Lucia widened her eyes. So how did the previous 17.8% come from? I just lost a piece of mind incense burner. Was it because I successfully defeated the other party? He gritted his teeth and once again entered the battle of remembrance. This time, he used his spiritual power to create a calming incense burner of the same dosage and placed it in his hand. Taking advantage of Samuel's unpreparedness, he knocked it down and used the dragon scale knife to save his life. However, after withdrawing from the retrospective, the new parsing progress left him completely speechless. Still 18.1%. It seems that using the same tactics to deceive people is useless. In the following period of time, he tried to use his spiritual power to create other suitable environments for combat, but either he was killed by Samuel's quick pass without any effect, or he successfully tricked the opponent but the analysis progress completely came to a halt. Due to helplessness, he had no choice but to engage in direct combat with Samuel. In the following three battles, he persisted with 20.2 moves in the longest and only 3 moves in the shortest, but was suddenly turned into ashes by the opponent's sudden outbreak of a black flame vortex. After 3 attempts, the parsing progress slowly advanced to 18.3%. It has been proven that without further improvement in his strength, the growth of analysis progress will undoubtedly suffer a devastating decline, and relying on the method of hard grinding each session is simply not feasible. Ah, Lucia sighed faintly, feeling like trying to cheat in a single-player game, only to find that all the methods she had come up with with, with her meager intelligence had been predicted and eliminated by the game in advance. In the end, she could only start from scratch honestly. Seeing that the analysis progress could not be pushed to 20% in a short period of time, he waved his hand to dispel the star representing Samuel, and checked the entire memory battlefield again. After confirming that there were no more gains for the time being, he restrained his spirit and returned to the real world. The sound of wheels rattling still lingered in his ears. Lucia pushed open the car window, and in the dim morning light, the sun had not yet risen, except for the slightly white sky in the northeast. It seemed that only a few minutes had passed since he entered the battlefield of memories. He took a deep breath of the cold air, and his mood relaxed accordingly. Anyway, he now has a way to upgrade and add points. Even if he cannot temporarily explore the so.called analysis node function, he has at least obtained an extremely effective cultivation field. As long as there is a continuous way to become stronger, he has the confidence to deal with all the difficulties that may arise in the future. Anyway, he is already in a position where he cannot retreat, and no matter who, he will always have to fight, and of course, the dragon is the same. Your Highness, do you have any orders? Agkis, who was not far away, saw Lucia open the window and immediately drove his horse forward. How long until we reach Karen City? Agkis looked up at the sky and replied, at the current speed, it will take about four to five hours, and we should arrive before noon at the latest. Okay, Lucia said as she moved her shoulders and lumbar spine. Last night was so chaotic, and I guess everyone was also tired. Today happened to be Karen's half day of grooming. He looked up and saw the heavily armored storm knights of the battalion rushing towards the distance along the winding imperial road. At the end of his sight, the vast plateau towering into the clouds was already faintly visible. End of this chapter Chapter 7 Exploration you are listening at Novel Full. Audio. Chapter 7 Exploration What, Don't Let Us Enter the City. Gylier sat high on the back of a dragon scaled horse, his beautiful eyes slightly narrowed, and he looked coldly at the trembling man below. Your Highness Lucia was invited by His Majesty Marika to visit Rotor. What do you mean? Now, on behalf of the Golden Dynasty, your city of Karen refuses the visit of Sky City and wants to keep us out, right? No, no, no. The envoy from the city of Karen trembled all over upon hearing this, 
and immediately bent down with a trembling voice, saying, I hope your esteemed envoy will be aware that neither I myself nor the city of Karen dare. Nor have the right to offend His Highness Lucia, it's just that. Just what? Gailier said impatiently as he hesitated to speak. The man raised his eyes and scanned the many restless storm nights around him, then looked at the icy gill. He lowered his head and gritted his teeth, saying, Please allow me to meet His Highness Lucia, and then report to His Highness and several officials in person. After speaking, he still couldn't stop trembling all over, but in the end, he stuck his neck in place and refused to say any more words. You guy. Gailier pressed his hand on the handle of the knife, involuntarily emitting a surge of dragon power that seemed like substance, almost suffocating the person. A sound of hooves shattered the solemn atmosphere like iron, and Agis drove his horse to Girol's side, saying, Your Highness has an order to allow him to report to the Central Army. Gailier was slightly taken aback, but did not refute anything. He just coldly glanced at the man who was almost falling to the ground and said, Stand still, come with me. A moment later, the man met the newly born demigod who had been rumored throughout the dynasty at a temporary riverside camp. When his gaze fell on the appearance of a fourteen-year-old boy, there was a hint of unshakable surprise on his face. Don't be surprised, the way ancient dragons grew up is far from the way you humans grew up. To be precise, my childhood has been spent in that dragon egg for the past thousand years. Lucia, who was flipping through a book, glanced up at him lightly. If you are ready to give a relatively reasonable explanation for your actions, please explain it as soon as possible before my patience runs out. The man's heart trembled, and in the moment he was swept by those icy blue eyes, he suddenly had the illusion that all his secrets were being seen through by the other party. He didn't know if this feeling was due to the spiritual pressure of the other party as a demigod, or because this, young man, was clearly more mature and indifferent than he expected. Sir Clare, currently serving as the internal affairs officer of Karen City, pay respects to your highness. He knelt on both knees and bowed to Lucia. According to the cultural tradition of the border area for thousands of years, the most solemn etiquette among mortals is simply the one knee kneeling ceremony. Only gods, demigods, and the recognized king of Elden on the entire continent are qualified to bear this level of ceremony. Flat, Lucia said calmly. Even before the start of this journey, he had systematically studied the complete political system, bureaucratic structure, and cultural customs of the Golden Dynasty, so he naturally understood what Claire meant by, internal affairs officer. Unlike the system of military and political separation in many cities in the Yatan region, the Golden Dynasty only had one consul as the highest official in many remote cities, responsible for all military, political, and livelihood affairs in the city. This model is certainly not reasonable and often not fair, but it excels in its simplicity, roughness, and high efficiency, effectively maintaining Rotor's control over the border territory during the more than ten years of the initial establishment of the dynasty. Although Karen City is close to the Alton Plateau, it has always maintained this system due to its proximity to the turbulent Khmer region and facing military pressure from the Asian and wandering mountain demon tribes. The SODOT called internal affairs officers are deputy officials responsible for coordinating internal affairs under the system of consuls. They are not appointed by Rotor, but are elected locally and have no real power, only assisting the chief official in handling various complex affairs. Correspondingly, the political status of these people is also quite low, and any consul holds the power to take life or death from them. Clavier stood up slightly stiffly, his gaze carefully fixed on the ground at the foot of Lucia, and said, Your Highness, the matter of the embassy stationed outside the city is not decided by the lower officials, but by the temporary order issued by the Consul Hector this morning. The reason is that there have been rebellious Asian tribes attempting to infiltrate the city of Karen for ten months to destroy its defenses. He is worried that the chaos caused by welcoming the embassy will be taken advantage of by the enemy. Once several city defense hubs are infiltrated by the enemy, the consequences will be unimaginable. Doing extraordinary things during extraordinary times is understandable, Lucia pondered slightly, leaning on her lower jaw with one hand. 
However, from his still calm and watery tone, Clavier could not discern his true intentions. However, he changed his tone, is he planning to close the city gate like this, allowing us to sleep and eat outdoors in the wilderness, and leave on our own at dawn tomorrow? Dare not. Clavier bowed deeply again, I am in charge of assisting with the internal affairs of the city. I have set up a camp for your highness and the envoys ten miles east of the city, and all kinds of supplies are ready. Please move and station your highness. The words fell to the ground, but Lucia did not respond. Clavier lowered his head and could feel the other person's gaze silently examining him. He dared not make any movement and had to wait in a respectful posture. At the same time, the cold sweat had unknowingly soaked through the clothes behind him. After enduring a long time in this fleeting atmosphere, Lucia's words finally came from ahead. Since Clavier has already arranged everything, everyone has been exhausted from the dust all the way here. Let's go to the station as soon as possible. He stood up and put away the book at hand, waved his hand, and the knight standing beside him immediately led a silver dragon scale horse. Lucia stepped on the stirrup and flipped over cleanly. This kind of warhorse with the lower dragon bloodline is already extraordinary in martial arts. At this moment, there is a young demigod sitting on the saddle with a spirit like the rising sun, which looks even more exciting to Clavier's heart. Since the Lord had already given the order, Gariel and Agkis did not hesitate at all. They immediately reorganized their troops according to their own responsibilities and prepared to escort Lucia on their journey. In the queue of action, Clavier was about to go to the front army to guide the way, but Lucia waved his hand and said, just leave that kind of thing to the soldiers who came with you. Clavier Ching might as well come with me. There are also a few things I want to know about with you. Clavier lifted his head, although the other party did not speak in a commanding tone, he knew from the light, watery expression in the eyes of the silver-haired boy that he had no right to refuse. So he took a deep breath and bowed, saying, I obey your orders. End of this chapter. Chapter 8 Conclusion You are listening at NovelFull.audio Chapter 8 Conclusion Karen City is a small city with a population of about 20,000, located at the exit of the Vanya River Valley. It not only guards a waterway leading to Lyonia, but also blocks the unrest in the Gmir region for Alton. If we continue northeast, within 200 miles, it will be the most dangerous pass at the border. And also the Dia's Great Escalator, the first trench on the continent. In summary, this not wealthy city was extremely crucial to the strategic position of the Golden Dynasty. All of its rulers came from the most deeply rooted aristocratic family in the country, and the ownership of this power naturally became a battlefield for various factions to compete with each other. For the past three years, the consul of the city of Karen has been held by Baron Hector O'Neill of Lunt. Yes, this baron's fiefdom is not Karen, but the town of Lunt located on the Alton Plateau. As mentioned in the preface, although the O'Neill family has been known for its military achievements for generations and can be considered a first-class aristocratic family in the dynasty, its political enemies are also powerful giants with strong backgrounds. They can tolerate opponents temporarily holding a crucial position, but they cannot easily let O'Neill take root and grow here. Since the War of Unification, this political rule has been deeply rooted in this land with the expansion of the Golden Dynasty. Even the Baron himself was exceptionally brave, and his two brothers, who respectively served as the Governor of Rhodes and Deputy Commander of the Northern Legion, were just a cluster of waves in this vortex. Has Clavier brought the people of Sky City to the camp yet? Hector stood at the top of the city, looking towards the east of the city, and said with his back to the galloping scout. At this moment, as dusk approached, the glow fell on the baron's hard beard and rough skin, reflecting a color similar to the city walls of ochre. Coupled with his towering and extraordinary figure, it was as intimidating as a stone statue carved with knives and axes. Yes, Tanma bent down and reported, His Highness Lucia specially invited the Minister of Internal Affairs to accompany him on his way to the campsite. The two of them seem to have a great conversation. Humph, he always shares the same stench as those monsters. 
Hector's gaze showed a strong disdain, even though the situation is so tight these days, we still have to bring out a lot of supplies to receive these guys seriously. If it weren't for. Halfway through, he suddenly abruptly stopped talking, waved his hand impatiently, and said, forget it, let's all go down. The scout and the two guards around him were both granted amnesty and quickly retreated after bowing. In these days, everyone knows that the newly born prince of the ancient dragon will come to his country to act as a proton, so everyone does not regard him as an equally noble existence as the current demigods. However, demigods are ultimately demigods, and even Baron Hector is not qualified to speak out some blasphemy, and they, as subordinates, have no courage to listen. Wait, Hector called out to a guard who had not yet gone far. When Clavier returns, tell him to stay honest in the city for the next few days. If I catch evidence of his collusion with those bandits, he knows the consequences himself. Obedience. The guard secretly complained, but could only pretend to calmly accept it. He had already begun to figure out how to convey this almost threatening warning to the interior officer. At the same time, in the temporary camp more than ten miles east of the city, the Sky City mission had already settled down under the guidance of a small number of Karen guards. With the experience of being raided by the Apostles of the Divine Skin the day before, the defensive fortifications around the camp had been strengthened, and the number of night shift personnel had increased by three times. For a super elite force composed entirely of storm knights and dragon warriors, this level of defense is already sufficient to deal with a small dot scale war. A bonfire had already been lit on the open space in front of the imperial tent. After arranging the handover of the camp, Clavier was brought in by Lucia for a chat, while Agkis and Gariel sat on both sides of Lucia's guard. Oh. Clavier used to work as a bartender in Rhodes. Lucia raised her eyebrows slightly. Your Highness, Clavier nodded respectfully, I am the teacher of a court perfumer. I have been practicing perfuming with him since I was twelve years old. At the age of twenty point two, my teacher passed away, and I took over his mantle. I worked as a perfumer in Wangdu for more than ten years. It was not until five years ago that I was demoted to Karen for some reason, and later I was trusted by the people of the same city that I reluctantly became this internal affairs officer. After hearing this, Lucia showed a strange expression on her face and asked, since you are the legitimate disciple of the palace perfumer, I believe Clavier Ching's original perfuming skills were also quite outstanding. I heard that His Majesty Marika has always valued talent, so how could you easily be demoted from the capital? Of course, he smiled apologetically, I'm just curious. If there's anything offensive, Clavier Ching won't answer. Your Highness is speaking more seriously, Clavier appeared quite indifferent. Since your highness has asked a question, where can I refuse to answer? His face flashed with an imperceptible bitter smile, and he continued, actually, it's easy to say. Back then, I saved an unworthy person in Rhodes, or rather, a bastard. I heard that there was a great figure in the royal capital who wanted him to die, but he was saved by me on the brink of death. And I was probably going to be erased by that great figure along with him. But later, a decree suddenly came from the palace, sending someone to take the mixed race away, and I inexplicably survived. A few days later, I received a dismissal order sent to Karen. Do you still remember the mixed race name? He didn't say anything, and I didn't ask too many people who had been treated back then. I can't remember so many names. Lucia sighed in her heart that in the holy land at the foot of the golden tree in the capital city of Rhodes, the mixed and ominous sons were mostly persecuted by non-human beings. Even the two demigods born to Queen Marika could not escape their fate of being imprisoned in the sewer, and only a few simple and enthusiastic perfumers were willing to treat them as humans and spare no effort to provide help. He remained silent for a moment and said, According to Claire, you have been with Karen for five years. Have you ever started a family here? On his way to the campsite today, he only asked Claire about the situation in Karen City, including the recent anxious Asian rebellion, and often consulted him for his opinions on Hector's governance methods. At this moment, 
he had already made a rough judgment in his heart and felt the atmosphere was quite heavy. He just casually asked, ready to express some concern. Unexpectedly, as soon as these words were spoken, Clavier's expression suddenly darkened. He lifted his head, which had been intentionally or unintentionally lowered, and looked straight into Lucia's eyes. In the dim sky and the flickering flames, the man in his forties looked like a withered piece of rotten wood, with only his eyes reflecting flames and ashes flickering slightly, as if trying to distinguish something. After a moment, he lowered his eyes, hesitated his lips a few times, and said in a hoarse voice, I have adopted a daughter who died last year. This time, Lucia's lips moved slightly, but she couldn't ask anything. Shortly thereafter, as he watched the man's decadent figure recede under the full moon, Gariel, standing beside Lucia, couldn't help but ask, that's just an ordinary human. What exactly does your highness want to confirm and send Agkis to track him all the way? He wants to use me to kill Hector, and now I plan to save his life. Don't you see that? Lucia turned to her and said. The dragon girl, who was originally dissatisfied with her eyes, immediately froze in place upon hearing this, her heroic eyebrows and eyes filled with confusion. Ah! End of this chapter Chapter 9 Conspiracy You are listening at NovelFull.audio Chapter 9 Conspiracy, based on your observations over the past half day, what kind of person do you think he is? Lucia patiently guided. Well, Goyerel thought for a moment, he's a bit timid, but he's very kind in nature, and his speech and behavior can be called humble and cautious. In any case, he's much stronger than the incompetent Karen Consul. If you let go of the timidity that comes with your subjective assumptions, Lucia smiled faintly, you're basically right. Whether it's his etiquette in dealing with people, his thoughtful arrangements for the camp, or the various details exposed in later conversations, they can all serve as evidence. However, it is such a kind, humble, cautious and thoughtful person who did not try to persuade his superiors to come out to pick him up, and even told us in person that this disrespectful and arrogant reception method was completely the result of the consul's stubbornness. Isn't this contradictory? He rubbed the handle of the dragon scale knife around his waist with his palm and pondered, if I were as proud, impatient, and irritable as many young dragon clans, and showed no tolerance for others to offend my own honor and dignity, he would probably add more guidance and hints accordingly, and even use appropriate selling to draw boundaries and insight. But after seeing myself and testing my reaction slightly, he wisely gave up this idea and prepared to leave as soon as possible to avoid further exposure to my attention. At this moment, Gailier also realized everything, but Lucia's words were not right, making her seriously doubt that the statement about many young dragon tribes was implying her. So, from then on all the way until just now, your highness has been making a comeback and constantly testing him from various aspects. Yes, no, Lucia said. Although we haven't been together for a long time, I found one thing that he and I are very similar to. We both trust our intuition. Just like he found out through intuition that he doesn't have the ability to use me. When I invited him along, I already determined his intention, and then it was just further verification. But there's one more thing I don't understand, Gariel said in confusion. He should have also noticed His Highness's intention to probe. If that's the case, why didn't he continue to cover up when His Highness asked about his family affairs in the end? Do you also think I was probing at that time? Lucia smiled with a hint of helplessness. Ah. Gailier felt as if the rhythm he had just caught up with had once again drifted away from him. Isn't that right? The emotions between humans can sometimes be such strange things. I tested him a hundred times, and he covered it up very well. But when I accidentally asked a sincere question, I happened to poke at something he didn't want to hide under his mask. He glanced at the young girl next to him with his spare light. Although the other person was over two hundred years old, for him, who had already established knowledge of the world from a higher dimension in two generations, Gariel still seemed like a simple and childish child. I can hear that everything he has done in Rhodes is true, and there is no possibility or need for him to deceive us at this point. 
When we arrive at the capital, if we have the intention, we can naturally verify it, Lucia lowered her eyes. If it's just a reason to save him once, that's enough. Even though I am not a human, what do I know about human emotions? Gillo muttered to himself, but instead of singing a different tune, he put on a deep and thoughtful expression before nodding slightly and saying, that's it. Anyway, although she dislikes the vast majority of decisions made by this guy since he broke the shell, this time she has no reason to object. At the same time, more than ten miles away from the Sky City camp, Claire, who was supposed to return to Karen, made a big detour after confirming that there was no one following him, and sneaked into a dense forest in the north of the city under the gradually heavy darkness. Looking around, he placed his finger on his lips and blew the previously agreed-upon secret code. After three sounds, the branches and leaves of a large tree not far away rang out, and an agile and agile black shadow rushed down the trunk, taking a few steps to graze in front of Clavier's horse. Through the moonlight scattered in the forest, one can see a rather ferocious face. A deep scar slanted diagonally from his left forehead to his right lip, with stitched marks resembling twisted centipedes. In addition, the faint chill in his iron-gray eyes and the Caden long sword behind his broad shoulders all revealed that he was a tough and ruthless character. Looking at your lost and confused appearance, did the other party not agree the man sneered. Isn't this expected? Claire replied equally bluntly, what I didn't expect was that his highness was so old and spicy that he didn't seem like a young man. If Rhodes and his gang saw him as a child who could be easily manipulated, they would definitely be in his hands and would be beaten to death. Oh, the man said with great interest, I can't believe that a newly born demigod can make you give such a high evaluation. So, in your opinion, how does that little dragon compare to the princes of Rhodes and Kalia? I don't want to answer such meaningless questions, Claire said coldly. We don't have much time, it's best to get straight to the point. The man shrugged his shoulders but did not continue to entangle, saying, we have prepared everything here. More than half of the Asian tribes in the southern part of Gmir have sent the most elite soldiers, and there are also twenty adult mountain monsters on standby. Kruger asked me to tell you that as long as you can expose Hector and his guards more than fifteen miles away from Karen, we have enough time to hang them all. More than half. Claire couldn't help but be shocked by the other party's mobilization ability, and after a moment of reflection, said, I emphasize again that all the equipment and supplies in Hector's army belong to you this time. Afterwards, I will also add an additional batch of food and medicine, but I will never think of farming outside the city, otherwise everything will be discussed. I know, I know, the man said helplessly, raising his hands. You've said it many times. You know who Kruger is, and even if someone has other ideas, can you still be influenced by us with your skills? Just understand, Claire said lightly. In that case, I will secretly control the outposts used by Hector to investigate the military situation and pass on the false information we need to him at the appropriate time. Tomorrow noon, when the Gulong mission is far away from Karen City, Hector and his troops will pass through the Sunset Pass, and I will ensure that everything develops according to plan within the team. From the time the former army passes through the pass, you have thirty-five minutes to end the battle. Very good, the man said with a fierce smile after receiving the final arrangement from Clavier. We won't let you down. End of this chapter. Chapter 10. Prayer. You are listening at NovelFull.audio. Chapter 10 Prayer More than a hundred miles north of Karen City, there is a hidden valley where countless flames flicker, and the night breeze constantly brings in noisy sounds. Approaching the valley for hundreds of meters, one can easily see hundreds or even thousands of marching tents in the valley. Most of these tents are extremely dilapidated, with a few sturdy branches that have undergone simple dehydration forming their main framework. They are then wrapped in a layer of tattered linen covered in stains and bloodstains, making them look like abscesses growing on the surface of the earth from a distance. Countless subhumans and mixed races intermingle among them, and occasionally one can see a pair of huge mountain demons, dressed in broken leather armor and wooden shields, holding rusty machetes and crooked wooden spears. 
If it weren't for the fact that most soldiers look quite strong and emit a fierce aura all over, no one would have associated them with the word elite. However, it is strange that the military tents in the entire campsite are largely different in terms of poverty, yet the layout of different regions is vastly different. Near the position of the Central Army, the distance between each tent and the way it is structured seem to have been accurately calculated, and even fire prevention measures and a large number of light and secret checkpoints are arranged around, appearing extremely strict. Correspondingly, there are two parts, the front and back. This group of subhumans and mixed species, which occupies 70% of the campsite area, presents various chaotic situations that are out of place with the military camp. Some people barbecue around the campfire, grilling the meat they have hunted during the day, while others grab patched leather wine jars and pour inferior liquor into their throats. The physical altercations and brawls caused by excessive energy after drinking and eating are not uncommon the Chinese army camp was established on a slightly higher plateau in the center of the valley. At this moment, a mixed-race old man with gray hair and wrinkles on his face was slightly hunched, brushing his beard and looking at the chaotic scene in the distance. His turbid eyes were full of worry. High priest, it's getting cold. You shouldn't be blowing here anymore, came a soft reminder from the guards behind. The old man didn't respond and still stared silently ahead. After a while, he let out a deep sigh. All right, Kruger, stop worrying about useless things. A gust of wind blew, but the mixed-race old man didn't dodge. He saw a ball of clothes thrown into the air and landed on his thin shoulder. Didn't we anticipate such a situation when we gathered the tribal coalition? The person behind us casually said, while strode forward to the old man's side and casually helped him tidy up the cotton robe he had just put on. That was a tall and majestic Asian man in his forties, and compared to his short kin, even standing next to Kruger, a half-beast and half-human hybrid, his size appeared several times larger. The man turned to the guards on both sides and waved his hand, saying, I want to discuss the military situation with the high priest. Let's all go eat and rest first. There will be another war tomorrow. Give me enough strength. Yes, General. The guards looked delighted upon hearing this and bowed and retreated one after another. As the footsteps of the crowd faded away, there were only two figures, one big and one small, on the plateau where the tent was located. Kruger looked at the man and said, Cerrito, shouldn't you be sitting in front of the army at this time? How did you come back? Sit down. What's there to sit down for? You can't see what's going on over there. Cerrito rolled his eyes and simply sat down on the ground. Karen City is like a piece of fat dripping with sesame oil hanging in front of us poor people. Not to mention those small and unpopular villages, even our soldiers in Shuafeng are about to go crazy. He pointed to the direction where the guards had just left and said, those are the kids from the Rono family, right? I heard their family only suffered from a hailstorm this spring, so I'm waiting to grab more things and go back and add a few more tents this time, otherwise even this winter will be unbearable. All right. Kruger stopped his chatter, even if the prey is right in front of us, it's not a reason for us to abandon military discipline. Also, don't beat the drum with me. This time, we only use Hector's troops. I don't care how you and the leaders below discuss it, we can't step into Karen's half-step this time. Cerrito's face looked a bit ugly. Just for the worthless agreement with Clavier. As long as you kill Hector, Karen will be easy to get. What can he do to us at that time? He's just a perfumer, not a furnace knight. Shallow. Kruger glared at him with resentment, why do you think I promised him not to violate Karen and the conditions of the surrounding farms? It's because I'm afraid of his force. Have you ever thought that even if we take Karen, what can we do? The Golden Court can tolerate us for a few days. Dida's is only 200 miles away from here, and they only need to send 50 Rhodes Knights, accompanied by 200 fully armed soldiers, to hang all of us on the repentance rack, or even worse. 
The Asians are fed chronic poison and pulled to work as laborers to fill mountains and rivers, mixed species are sent to the arena to please their nobles with blood and life, and finally use anchor chains to pierce through the mountain demons' abdominal cavities, and then give them gorgeous gold armor to be used as livestock for pulling carts. What if we don't take it? Cerrito's face turned purple as he choked his neck and argued, Can you guarantee that after we leave, Clavier will become the consul of Karen? Can you guarantee that he will keep his promise after sitting in that position, deliver the agreed food and medicine, and ensure that everyone has space to survive in the future? I can't. Of course I can't. Kruger widened his eyes and said, but do we have a better choice? Otherwise, we'll ransack Karen and leave with our belongings. The Gmil Mountains are so big that even if someone really comes, Dakotas won't be able to find us. You fart. Kruger was so angry that his hair was wide open that he jumped up and kicked Cerrito. No matter how big Grimer is, he's bigger than Alton. He even ransacked Karen. How many people are you planning to kill? The demigod Gulong just passed by here. What's the difference between doing something like this and stepping the faces of the two lords into the soil? How many days do we still have to live? Cerrito was refuted and speechless, so he stood up angrily and said, I will continue to patrol the front army. If Tulark comes back later, I will bring him to see you. After that, he turned around without looking back. Looking at the figure behind him, Kruger took a deep breath, and a strong sense of fatigue appeared in his bloodshot eyes. Cerrito is more than ten years younger than him, and the two have been intimately connected for decades. It is precisely through the joint wisdom and efforts of the two that the Shuafeng tribe has become increasingly prosperous, gradually bringing together many sub-people and mixed-race tribes in the southern part of Khmer. However, with the expansion of power, the ambitions and desires of many people in the tribe also expanded, and Cerrito, who was only below him, was even more so. Kruger knew that he didn't have many days left to live, and his early life of hunger, cold, and war had greatly damaged his body. It was because of this that he valued the war in Karen City so much and mercilessly criticized Cerrito. Only by allowing Karen City to transition safely to Claire's hands and letting Cerrito learn to think from his perspective can he let go with peace of mind. A cold night breeze blew, and the old man couldn't help but tighten his tight cotton robe, rolling out a few painful coughs in his throat. May God bless our nation. Kruger silently prayed in his heart as he gazed at the cold full moon and the dark black moon in the sky. He didn't go to see the golden tree because the golden law couldn't accommodate these foreign races. End of this chapter